I appreciate the invitation to talk, and uh, it's a special privilege. Thanks for inviting me. It's, uh, it's, it's not our typical audience to be able to talk to families and uh, advocates for congenital heart disease. We, I usually talk to a scientific uh, clinician audience, and so this is a special opportunity, and, and uh, I really appreciate it. I, uh, uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, what may be the future uh, and maybe an upcoming uh, huge advance in the field, but I don't know that for sure yet. Uh, working on it uh, remains to be seen. Uh, can I ask for uh, anybody to raise their hand if they're a Fontan patient? Actual Fontan. Great. And then families of Fontan patients? Yeah, a lot. Okay. So uh, Fontan and single ventricle in it is a dominant part of congenital heart disease, and it's a uh, it's a uh, problem that uh, we deal with as clinicians. Uh, challenging for sure, uh, fairly common. It's uh, it's been a problem that uh, I've looked at and felt that we can do better, uh, and I will uh, to, to get, kind of wake you up a little bit. I don't think we're doing well enough, and I think we can do better. That's, that's provocative. I wouldn't necessarily say that in front of a doctor audience, but <laughs> I say it here. Uh, and I think by the end, hopefully you'll agree that we're uh, uh, maybe not doing as well as we can and, and potentially can do better. I, I'm not putting down the Fontan. Uh, obviously, without it, uh, lots of people wouldn't have a chance. It's very important. But I, I think that there will be ways that we can make it better. I wanted to uh, just go through a couple of disclosures. So uh, a lot of the work you're going to see has been funded by an NIH grant uh, that I uh, was privileged to have. And if you may or may not know what NIH grants are, but it's a it's a marker of excellent science. It's uh, they're tough to get, uh, especially for surgeons. Uh, it's, it's kind of a joke. But, uh, <laughs> Children's Heart Foundation has funded some of this work, so it's come from foundation support. And really, a, a fair bit of it's come from donor support uh, around my institution. Uh, I am an inventor of some of the technology you're going to see. So I do have an ownership interest, at least in uh, the device concept that you're going to see. So uh, I'm going to break down and talk about Fontan a little bit. And I probably will talk about it in a way that you haven't heard before. Uh, Fontan repair is palliation. Palliation means it's not a cure. It's a, uh, it's a surgical or medical uh, therapy that results in uh, temporization, but it's not, uh, it's not a cure, okay? And when we hear the word palliation, we think we know what that means, but I want you to really, you know, kind of think about it. And people with a Fontan circulation have an inefficient circulation. Uh, yes, they can live with the Fontan circulation, but they don't have a normal biventricular circulation. They're missing the right-sided pump. Their circulation is inefficient, okay? And that uh, circulation will eventually fail. When it'll fail is a little bit unclear. There haven't been enough Fontans around for enough decades to know, you know, exactly when a Fontan is going to fail. Some fail early, some fail uh, very early. Some are still going in their 40s or 50s and are doing fine. So that's that's still a little unclear, but the prevailing opinion is that, is that most Fontan circulations are going to fail. And there really is no therapy for that. We uh, don't have a primary targeted therapy for Fontan failure. So this is a recent publication from the Mayo Clinic. It's 40 year follow up after Fontan operation. It uh, is sobering to see this uh, survival curve uh, Francis Fontan himself predicted this in a classic paper in the mid-1980s, outcomes after a perfect Fontan operation. If you ever go to the medical literature, it's an interesting paper. It's got a very catchy title, Outcomes After a Perfect Fontan Operation. And basically, uh, and we surgeons feel like we often do perfect operations. <laughs> we know there's a drop-off, and this drop-off uh, is now apparent. Okay. This is an older group of patients that were operated 30 or 40 years ago. It's not uh, the same as today. It's a moving target, but still we're seeing it, what we call late Fontan attrition. 
people uh, eventually get Ponzi and failure. And so uh, it's a uh, it's a pressing concern that we, you all, and we as clinicians are now facing. It's it's the train coming down the tracks. We're doing Fontan repairs and single ventricle kits. They survive. That's great. Uh, but we're uh, seeing now the consequences of that. So there's what I call Fontan groupthink, and, and groupthink is a kind of a catchy term that, that means uh, what people uh, that people won't necessarily say anything different than what the majority of the group thinks. Okay, and and amongst clinicians, the groupthink is. Once you've gotten your Fontan, you're done. Pat on the back, that's great. Have a great life. And at age uh, two or four, whenever a child's Fontan is completed, there's not a lot of discussion about what's gonna happen when they're 13, or when they're 20, or when they're 30. Of course, uh, clinicians don't wanna dwell on that for a parent you know, who's just gotten their child through their Fontan. That's, that's a thing to celebrate. But uh, once you're palliated, you're not necessarily done. Okay, and that's what this is going to get at. So there really hasn't been a lot of perspective on long-term implications with Fontan, but I think as a field, we're beginning to wake up to that. Part of the reason we haven't talked a lot about it is because there haven't really been any alternatives. It's kind of like, well, that's the way it is, and, and this, is, this is what we have. There's not much else we can do about it, okay? But there are these other problems that are beginning to emerge, so liver disease, protein losing enteropathy, plastic bronchitis, and ultimate failure. These are markers of the Fontan circulation that's beginning to have problems, okay? And we're starting to see more and more of those. Uh, this may be a little upsetting uh, to show to a non-medical audience, okay? This is a patient of mine. Uh, this is a patient with a Fontan. And, and she's a teenage girl who had a failing Fontan. She has the classic uh, features of a failing Fontan. So she's got a distended belly, fluid in her abdomen, thin uh, extremities, uh, muscle atrophy, pubertal delay. She came to the operating room for a heart transplant. I did her heart transplant. I took out her single ventricle heart and put in a biventricular heart. So she got a two ventricle repair, which is great. Transplant, uh, transplants have their own issues. It's a, it's a different set of problems, and it may not be a lifetime cure. The reason I show this is because uh, this girl had Fontan failure uh, where her failure was not in her uh, ventricle or the pump. The failure was on the right side of her circulation where she was missing the pump. And when I took her heart out, the uh, pressure that was generated by her ventricle was about 200, okay? This was not a failing heart. So uh, clinicians uh, have to get their brains around uh, if Fontan failure is not necessarily the same thing as pump failure, okay? I took out a perfectly normal, good single pump on this girl and put in two normal pumps, okay? So I'm a little morally conflicted about uh, having done a transplant on a patient uh, and taken out a otherwise good functioning ventricle. It's a little bit of a stretch, but I, I want to try to make the point to you. Uh, mechanical circulatory support devices for Fontaine failure uh, don't really exist, and um, I won't go into a lot of detail about that. Blood pumps exist generally for uh, what we call systemic uh, heart failure, where the, uh, the high pressure pump doesn't uh, perform well. Uh, but there is not a blood pump specifically designed for Fontan failure or uh, the deficiency, which is the lack of the right side of pump. So uh, these are uh, limited to case reports. There's probably about 40 in the literature. Uh, surgeons don't report their bad outcomes, so there have probably been more that didn't go well. Okay, But there really isn't a blood pump option that's a good option for Fontan patients unless they have failure of their single ventricle. If that's the problem, then there are blood pump therapies available. If they have Fontan failure, there's nothing available for them. So all devices basically are uh, uh, designed for systemic support. All devices have been attempted to be applied in Fontan. Uh, yes, a surgeon can do it. Just because a surgeon can do something doesn't mean it's always the best thing to do. 
and uh, basically current devices are not well suited for Fontan. I'm going to try to break this down a little bit. Uh, this will be a little bit of, uh, uh, I may get lost in the details too much. This is a case report of a blood pump, uh, for example, of Berlin Heart. It's used for systemic uh, ventricle failure, and this was applied to a Fontan. So here's the Fontan connection, this sort of cross-shaped connection where the, the vena cava, vena cava connected to the pulmonary arteries. The only way you can put a blood pump into this circulation is to take it down, okay? So the Fontan has to be taken down. The reason is because this blood pump has one inflow and one outflow. Well, here you got, you've got two inflows and two outflows, and you gotta separate these in order to get the blood to go in the right direction, okay? So it's for this reason that it's very hard for surgeons to put a blood pump in their Fontan circulation, among several other reasons. This blood pump is uh, not designed to give low pressure flow, and in the uh, blood flow through the lungs, is normally about a quarter or a fifth of the pressure that you have in blood flow to the body, okay? So you're asking a pump to operate at a lower pressure, it'll generate clot. It's not designed to operate at the lower pressure range, so it's just not the right. If this pump fails for any reason, it's gonna block right-sided circulation, that's gonna be a lethal problem. So uh, how do you tackle this? So these are schematics of uh, normal circulation on the left, Fontan in the middle. Normal circulation, left ventricle pumps to the body, right ventricle pumps to the lungs. Venous pressure, IVC and SVC or via cable pressure is low. It picks up pressure by 10, gets blood flow through the lungs. And then it, it maintains the filling pressure to the high pressure pump. If this pump doesn't fill well, it's not gonna pump well. Okay, this is Fontan, so they're missing, they're missing a pump here, okay? It's about as simple as I can explain it to you. A solution, a potential solution is to put the missing pump back in, okay? So in a Fontan, single ventricle pumps to the body, venous blood supplies the force for blood flow through the lungs. This venous pressure is about triple. And that's where you get into all this abdominal swelling, liver problems, all the back pressure, okay? If you can do this, and I think most people at face value would accept this, they say, well, that's, that's simple. Of course, why didn't somebody think of that before? Well, uh, this is the simplest part of it. Actually pulling this off is very complicated. Um, if you look back at the literature, some of the greats and giants in congenital heart disease actually predicted uh, that somebody might come along you know, and try to tackle this problem. Mark Villalal is a, is a surgeon who basically came up with a modern version of the Fontan cable pulmonary connection. It uh, is interesting uh, when you read the backstory to how uh, Mark Villalal figured out how to do the Fontan connection, they were actually trying to figure out how to put a pump into the Fontan circulation where the pump was missing. It's, uh, it's sort of not out there on the surface, but below radar, actually that's the backstory. So current blood pumps are designed to work here. If you try to put this blood pump into a Fontan patient, you may actually make this worse by pushing more blood into the venous side of the circulation and congesting the, congesting the right side of the circulation more. Okay, this is where, this is where the Fontan device needs to go. So uh, I'm gonna get into the uh, details of the, uh, of the device, uh, and I'll skip through a lot of the engineering detail, it gets pretty thick, pretty fast. But how are you gonna do this? How are you gonna put a blood pump into here that's gonna give you four directions of flow and is not gonna block flow, okay? And that's about 10 years worth of work, and I'm gonna just kinda get right to it. Passive flow optimization, so uh, Joshua talked about the 4D MRI and people trying to look at how can you optimize passive flow through the Fontan. Uh, and that's worthwhile. If there's blockage there, you don't want the blockage. But even with passive flow optimization, you're gonna get maybe a millimeter of mercury pressure improvement, okay? Well, it's not enough, in my opinion. You need, you're gonna need a pump. So, uh, 
Blood pumps can be put in in different configurations. This has all been looked at experimentally. Okay, this is the uh, this is the uh, solution that I'm going after. Okay, and then this is essentially it in a uh, in a simple form, a spinning disc at the center of the intersection. If this is spinning, it'll actually pump in four directions. Okay, and I'm going to show you the my favorite video. This was filmed in my garage in <laughs> Zionsville, Indiana. Okay, with parts from the hardware store, CVS pharmacy. Okay, with a uh, Dremel tool that I had in my garage. Okay, spinning. Uh, sorry, I just ruined it. Spinning disc underwater. So this thing is spinning, and it's in a glass tube, and you'll see some color move through. The cardiologist will uh, see, like seeing the contrast. <laughs> So uh, the, the other backstory of this video is I sent this in with my R01 grant application that this helped me get a $2 million award. Wow. The other uh, thing I want you to, to see, and most people, uh, it's obvious, if this is put into somebody, a Fontan, and it doesn't spin, it's not gonna block flow. Okay, and that's critical. Any blood pump uh, that's going to go into the middle of the bloodstream, if it fails for any reason, cannot block flow. That would be a lethal problem. So uh, that's one of the uh, engineering challenges to this pump, and uh, it's been a difficult thing to uh, try to deal with. Uh, some science, I won't go into details. We've, we've set up a Pontian circulation on table with pipes and tubing, and we can mimic it to a pretty high degree. And basically, uh, We've proven that a six millimeters uh, mercury pressure rise in the Fontan connection will restore the circulation to a two ventricle circulation. Okay, if you believe in uh, in vitro modeling, that's it. This uh, uh, is a conceptual drawing of where I started. I didn't know how I could get this blood pump in and out of a Fontan patient. This is what's in the literature. So this would be a catheter base, expandable pump that would rotate. So uh, Joshua and Evan could put it in in the cath lab. So needle stick in the groin. Okay, and this is this is what the R01 grant was based off of. Is this expandable concept? Because I I hadn't figured out how to get that pump in and out of somebody. Well, after uh, enough people came up to me and said, "Well, that idea is great. If you could do that on a permanent basis, then all your Fontan patients could be." two ventricle people. How can you do that permanently? And the, the question there is, well, how can you get a motor into this thing, okay? And it took me a couple of years and uh, scraping on the internet, and there's, there's nothing real scientific about it other than just kind of grit and determination. Uh, there is a way to put a motor into this, and that is uh, not obvious. Let's put the motor in the center. You can't put the motor out here because you'd have to close this gap, and that would make it obstructive. Okay. So uh, they make these kinds of motors. You all have one in your pocket in your cell phones. That's the little uh, buzzer thing that goes off on your silent mode. It's a little, uh, it's a little uh, off-weighted uh, motor. They're, they're ubiquitous. They're used in computer hard drives. This one was from the hobby shop at, uh, for an electric airplane. Uh, you know the uh, helicopters at uh, Brookstone. They use these motors. Okay, it's a little electric motor embedded in the center. This is an early stage prototype. Nothing moves here except for this thing. So it's 90 degrees uh, rotated the wrong way. But basically, uh, here it is, early prototype. Self-powered, hobby shop motor. Same as what you saw before, but permanent. Wow. This, uh, this was not... Uh, the Arlen grant, uh, when I when I got to this point, then I asked NIH to change the scope of the grant to chronic device. And I was about uh, three quarters of the way through my grant. So uh, uh, I was able to use grant funds to further develop this, but uh, I'm now currently out of that grant and in, in and in between trying to get prototype uh, stuff done. This is uh, a more complicated version, motor inside, it's a conical motor. Most motors are not conical, they're cylindrical, so when you get into conical motors, you get into a lot of complexity. And uh, this is another version of 
So uh, the pictures I'm going to show you are actually done with NASA. So I collaborated with NASA. They built conical motors. NASA did a press release on this in the past uh, four months or so. And maybe folks have seen it. It actually got a lot of attention. Uh, NASA builds conical motors uh, to use in the space station uh, energy storage flywheels. Uh, completely unrelated to uh, medical stuff, but I approached them and they were interested enough and I had enough funds uh, to uh, get them to go for it. Conical motor, conical magnets. Here's the NASA prototype, okay? It's about twice the scale it needs to be for an adult. Uh, bottom line is it functioned, but it didn't function through the full range. They had uh, some issues getting to higher speed with uh, the viscosity of blood is thicker than water and it took a little more power to get, uh, to get it to operate at higher speed. So uh, this wasn't going to be enough for me to go in with my next grant. So I stepped back to now a third prototype and this is actual ongoing work, not published. Uh, even more advanced. Has the proper uh, to have the proper bearing structure in here to allow blood flow to get through uh, the, between the rotating and the non-rotating components. Okay, so it's almost there, and I hope in uh, six months I'll be able to tell you conclusively that this is an adult-scale Fontan circulatory support device that uh, yeah, I can prove is functional. Uh, hydraulics. I won't get into the details. A lot of this engineering stuff, I don't have an engineering background, so I've had to go in a deep dive, you know, and find the people to do this. It's really, it takes years and it's been very challenging. So this is what it would look like to a surgeon, okay? There's two pumps in this picture. There's two pumps. The native ventricle, whether it's a left or a right, and this thing, the Fontan pump. The higher pressure pump is this one. The more important pump is this one. It's a person's own ventricle. This is a low pressure booster pump. It's not quite the same as a ventricular assist device. It must be a much lower pressure uh, than a typical ventricular assist device. It's a booster to the existing pump, okay? That's uh, conceptually very different from existing vans. So I, I'm talking to you about uh, potential to reverse the Fontan in patients talking to you about uh, being able to emulate biventricular circulation in Fontan patients. I'm talking to you about putting a blood pump into a Fontan patient before they fail. That's, uh, that's not a trivial uh, thing to think about. Biventricular maintenance then after this pump goes in. So maybe transplant can be pushed off for 20 or 40 years. Maybe, that's, that's the goal. Uh, this is more detailed stuff. So I'm going to skip. This kid is from Louisville, single ventricle Fontan patient, uh, biomedical engineering student. He's excited about this stuff and is involved a little bit. This kid lives in England. He's a Fontan patient, unbalanced AV canal, and just uh, two days ago he had his Fontan taken down in the cath lab. He's failing and may or may not get trained. Anybody know who the person on the right is? The guy on the left is me. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody want to say? Francis Fontana. So, he, uh, Actually, I uh, saw Dr. Fontan three weeks ago, so uh, there's a, a meeting that was just called Fontan Think Tank, uh, international group of surgeons and cardiologists that met in Bordeaux, France, just three weeks ago, first time, and uh, I got to see Dr. Fontan uh, and update him on this device. So he's aware of this, uh, he's seen some of the details, he's not, a, he's not an engineer, he's a retired heart surgeon, but he's supportive. He understands, you know, what what this is trying to get after. So that's that's been personally very meaningful to me, and uh, hopefully it's meaningful to you as well. That uh, the person who has his name, you know, on the operation actually understands the implications of palliation, and uh, probably will feel some relief in knowing that uh, the burden.
burden of late failure, you know, maybe lifted. Uh, pretty sure of that. That's it. Thanks.